Yay, thank you, Kirby, Brad, Jonathan, wow. and Matt. Thank you so much. And the fabulous Stevie Wonder. Ow! Yeah, higher ground. I have to put this up here. I won't be able to read the notes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so what a fabulous way to begin September together. We rise, and we are still looking for the higher ground, looking to rise to that higher ground since Stevie um, wrote that beautiful and amazing and fabulous song. And of course, Together We Rise, right? This is part of the reason why we have this as our theme for this month. Um, because we have to keep finding the higher ground, especially when it feels overwhelming, when it feels painful or scary. Rather than becoming angry or afraid or distracted or live in spiritual bypass, which some of us are very good at, so this, is month, this month is really about tackling this from a spiritual point of view. Yeah, so this month, uh, Together We Rise 2.0 is really about uh, the fact that, yes, we recognize and realize that every person on the face of the planet has suffered grief and loss. And we've had hurt and pain in our lives. And every child in some shape, form, or fashion has suffered disappointment or experienced rejection and lived with failure. And these are true experiences. They're real hurts. And to say otherwise is to disrespect and deny our embodied soulful human life. Mm -hmm. And so there is that which is within us though, that intuitively recognizes the beauty, the joy, and the abundance of life itself. And so over and over again, humanity has risen out of whatever mindset or what's ever going on in profound moments of spiritual revelation and human connection. And so this is what this month is about. And we here at CSL Dallas, no matter where our community members are, both locally and internationally, we continue our spiritual journey this year. We once again affirm, together we rise. We rise in our belief that we are not victims individually or collectively, and um, that life doesn't only happen to us, we also happen to life. So we're gonna use as our framework this month something that many of you are very familiar with. We're gonna um, really dive into the four stages of consciousness. We use this as a framework to walk through various ways in which we can in fact r find higher ground, not only sort of accidentally, but we can deliberately move ourselves through these four stages of consciousness and really find that higher ground, no matter what it is we're facing, no matter what it is that we're reading in the news, no matter what it is that's going on around us. So just as a very brief overview, the four stages of consciousness begin with stage one, which is that place of basically being unconscious basically being on autopilot, and it's the place where we find ourselves feeling victimized by life. Life is happening to us. I, we lost the job because the boss is a jerk, or because the economy, or because of the pandemic, or because of the things that we can't control. We have all this idea about life happening to us, and we can feel uh, unable to deal with it, or we, the truth is we're just unconscious, right? These are all the ways in which we distract ourselves and keep ourselves um, numb to the pain or the disappointment that we're experiencing. King, uh, stage two is when we begin to take personal responsibility for our engagement in life. The portal to stage two is the portal of personal responsibility. And stage two is where we begin to recognize that we actually participate in our own lives. The stage is called by me. And it is the opportunity where we begin to understand that our attitude makes a difference. How we tell the story makes the difference. What we choose makes the difference. And that we actually have the ability to make choices and decisions that make a difference. We learn about the indwelling presence and we learn about the power of our thinking. 
Beyond that, we begin to move into stage three, which is an opportunity to recognize that yeah, it's just not all about us and we're just not the ones with the power. That there is actually not only an indwelling presence, but there is a transcendent reality and of universal law that is actually moving through us. And that as we step out of the way, our humanness, we allow spirit and love and life to flow through us. So this stage three is through us consciousness. And the portal into it is surrender. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. <laughs> One of our least favorite words right up there with obedience. <laughs> so that's the place where we move to life is happening through us. And ultimately, we move to the place of transformation through the portal of transformation into stage four, where we recognize that, that we are actually life happening. Right here, life is happening. That and this, it's all, part, it's all the same thing and life is happening right where we are. And that as we speak our word, we're actually spiritual beings bringing consciousness into physical form and it is our most empowered place. So we're gonna use this as our framework for the month so that we can continually rise to that higher ground. Yeah, and this is, um, using this as a framework and focusing on Together We Rise is particularly important right now as there is so much to be anxious about. Mm -hmm. If there's not a little bit of anxiety going on in your life, I don't, I, I, I really need to understand <laughs> what you're doing. Um, but there is climate change, okay? Can we just say there is climate change? Uh, there are floods going on all over the place. There are droughts in, in other places. There are fires raging on this planet. There are heat waves, there's melting ice, there's species extinction, and there's human migration that has already started. And not only if that wasn't enough, there's still this pandemic that's going on globally. Uh, we've had loss of loved ones, illness, uh, lingering illness from it, uh, fear, anger, loss of work, change in our working habits, um, worry over our children and schools and our teachers and healthcare workers. And if that wasn't enough, we actually have draconian laws in Texas beginning this month. Yes, I said that. There is an abortion ban and people are being incentivized to pay to snitch on women and the people supporting them, voting restrictions, we can carry guns without any permit or anything, and that's just to name a few. So, where do we begin? And Ernest Holmes helps us to say uh, in this quote, there is this question which naturally rises, why all the suffering, sorrow, and pain? Why has tragedy accompanied the journey of humanity? Well, again, our imagination may answer this question in a somewhat plausible manner. There is no other way through which true individuality can evolve. We must be let alone to discover ourselves, else be compelled arbitrarily to follow one road, in which case we would be an automation, not an individual or an individualized expression. And think about if certain things were purely an automation instead of these individualized expressions. So we wanna start with this notion that, um, yeah, stuff happens, right? This is the first stage of consciousness. It's the awakening to the fact that stuff happens. And our spirituality isn't designed to pretend that that's not the case, right? When we're in our first stage of consciousness, we're, it's, it is the only place where we can begin to wake up. We begin to wake up to the fact that, that there, people are not having the full spiritual experience, which is the truth of their being. We're not caring for our planet in a way that is healthy. We're not loving each other in a way that is in accordance with every spiritual teaching, love your neighbor as yourself. 
And so it can be painful to wake up. And this is where we, we kind of can mix this, these two things. One, we, we wake up and we wish we hadn't. <laughs> it's really so much easier to blame everybody else, isn't it, right? And we, don't want, we just want to go unconscious. Couldn't we just be about our own life and have our little latte and our, you know, and whatever it is and, and just be about our own lives? Or, or do we really have to pay attention? And it, when we do pay attention, it's, it is actually really, really easy. I mean, the very first place that human beings go is blame. Just look at Adam and Eve, right? What was the very first thing that happened after they ate of the apple? Adam said, she made me do it. And Eve said, the snake made me do it, right? It was such a human moment. It was fa it's fabulous representation of the very first thing that we do is we feel as though someone has done it to us. So not only do we have to wake up to what's going on in the world, we also have to wake up to our response to that. Mm -hmm. We have to wake up to our response. It, are we immediately going to blame, shame, somebody ought to do something about this, who's doing this, who's doing it to me, and who's going to fix it? So I've been reading this fabulous book I want to tell you about just for a minute because I really found it, well, I don't know, I found it, I found it inspiring, but the truth is I also found it comforting. So I've been, I'm halfway through, so I'm not exactly sure how it ends, but this is a fabulous book. It's, um, it's not fiction. It's written by Michael Haig, and it's, it's a book called Notes to a Nervous Planet. And uh, Michael started writing out of his own anxiety disorder and depression. Um, he has written some really amazing books. He's also written a fabulous um, fiction book called The Midnight Library, which I hugely recommend. But he began finding himself falling back into suicidal depression not too long ago. And he, out of all of his therapy, he used all of his tools and all of that stuff. And he found himself still unbelievably anxious. And he began to really assess and look around and, and notice that, you know, pretty much everybody's feeling that way. And to explore not just our own contribution personally to anxiety, but how all of these situations are in fact it contributing to our experience of anxiety, depression, overwhelm, a sense of everything is too big for us to even handle. Mm -hmm. And it's all going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing we can do about it all of those really overwhelming, sort of helpless, powerless feelings. I don't know about you, I get them at three o'clock in the morning. I wake up and I, you know, think about the ice melting and I think about my, you know, my granddaughter in daycare and I think about all these things and I think about the people who are affected by some of these laws and all of that. And I mean, I'm grateful I have my spiritual tools to reach for, but it does kind of, it gets anxious and overwhelming. and. And yet there's something really powerful about acknowledging that, that it isn't just us. We're not just anxious because we're, we have an anxiety pathology, right? Could we just like say that? There, there's a lot going on and we have to find our way into higher ground and we have to find our way to engaging. But the first thing we have to do, we have to acknowledge what's going on. Yeah, so <coughs> um, there we go, Note, notes on a nervous planet. Um, we have to wake up and wake up to what's happening and mostly to our own engagement with it. So we got to first wake up and we have to engage. So the first thing is to wake up to what we do to stay unconscious. Okay, that's the first thing. The uh, under-informed, the lack of critical thinking, resistance, uh, weariness, blame, like Petra said. Uh, we find ourselves avoiding. Do you avoid? How do you avoid? Pretending it's all okay and doing that spiritual bypass, just pushing it away, or 
I don't know about you, but what is your distraction methodology? How are you distracting yourself? Or how are you medicating yourself? Mm -hmm. Each of us tends to do this in some shape, form, or fashion, and sometimes in both, the distracting and the medicating. Conversations, how many conversations have you had with the people in your life and it sounds like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe it. So that's the first thing, to waking up. And then the second thing is, we have to wake up to what we do to keep us feeling victimized and powerless mm. through anger, through blame, it's them, it's they, it's their fault, um, or pure exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we become enmeshed more in this cycle of fear and anger and ain't it awful. Uh, and inundating ourselves with the news and info and emails and petitions and videos and podcasts and conversations. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about this. Decades ago, we didn't have all of this inundation. In fact, we only had three news channels, mm -hmm. right? But we're inundated. Yep. So we've got to wake up to this. So this waking up can be really uncomfortable. Can we just, you know, acknowledge that too, <laughs> right? We didn't come here on a Sunday morning necessarily to, you know, hear about how awful it is. And we want to come and be inspired. We want to be in our spiritual bubble and we want to, you know, we want to feel good. But as it's been said in, for in so many ways and places, the only way out is through. And the way through is to begin with looking at and acknowledging what's going on, how we feel about it, where we're distracting ourselves. How do we get caught by things that really then um, um, trigger us in some big way, right? We start with this acknowledgement and we'll get to the spiritual support and inspiration and uplift that actually moves us out of this place. But it's like going on vacation. If you want to go to, if you decide you want to go to New York or to go to Los Angeles on a vacation, you have to actually first locate yourself on the map. Are you starting in Dallas? Are you starting in China? Where are you starting? That helps determine which direction and how you're going to get there. So Ernest Holmes says this, we know, and we will get to that. Oh, no, that's my, that's I wrote that. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. So we have a quote for you later. Yeah. Um, so another book that is helpful in this is an excerpt from the Pandemic Portal, mm -hmm. and it's by Arun Hadi Roy. And I want to share this. And... Um, Mr. Roy says, what is this thing that has happened to us? It's a virus, yes. In and of itself, it holds no moral brief, but it is definitely more than a virus. Some believe it's God's way of bringing us to our senses. Others say it's a Chinese conspiracy to take over the world. Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else Good. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, he says, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. Mm -hmm. This one is no different, for it is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, and dead ideas ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Mm. Or 
We can walk through lightly with a little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. <laughs> so we have uh, a couple of stories that will help sort of illuminate this idea of how we practice, Petra and I, um, waking up in the midst of all this stuff that's going on. So I'm going to begin with the story. You know, we were just on um, vacation in our cabin in New Hampshire, and it's a, a beautiful 220-acre um, protected area. There's 10 homes in it that people, um, most people um, have houses on, 10 lots. And uh, it was created with a beautiful um, little pond, and the pond is man-made and there's a stream that comes out of the actual beaver pond that existed and the stream goes into a big river and and when all of this was created this little pond was was a dam was put in and this little pond was created and um, last year there was a problem with the stream above the pond and we had to rebuild the stream bed and bring in the you know the environmental experts to do it correctly and all of that sort of thing um, to help with the habitat and and in that process Karen and I began to realize that there is some sense that our pond isn't as healthy as it could be it's not as alive as it could be actually truthfully Karen takes more pictures of birds here in Dallas than she does on our pond. That, that's like, that's amazing. And, and so I asked the consultant that was coming to work on our stream. I asked the consultant, so what's, you know, what can we do? Here was his answer to me. I found this incredibly profound. He said, well, he said, Petra, you know, this pond, nature didn't make this pond. We made this pond human people made this pond because nature didn't make it nature doesn't have its normal systems in which to keep the pond healthy so since we made the pond we're the ones who have to keep it healthy learn what it needs find out how to do that and provide that so the pond stays healthy you know, I thought about that for two or three or four days, and I was reminded of the, uh, what comes out of Genesis, out of the, mystic, the ancient mystics in Genesis, when in the metaphor of creation, right, humanity was given dominion over the earth. And we have come to understand dominion as domination, that we can use, and that it really is only for our use. And yet dominion actually is a very different um, etymology and it means something very different. Dominion actually means something much closer to stewardship, that we are the stewards of the earth because we can create ponds and lakes. We can decimate forests. We can completely change the natural environment. Ralph Waldo Emerson uses the term, he talks about if you want to know the character of a man, give him a 10 acre woodlot to husband. It's actually the word husband actually comes from agriculture, not from marriage. To husband a woodlot is to care for it, is to see when it needs to be pruned, what it needs, what needs to be taken away, how to help it flourish. Do you see? When we wake up to the fact that, we, when we stop being unconscious about the fact that the pond is not as healthy as it could be, and we don't blame the person at, who built it, or we don't blame the agencies, or we don't blame the people who aren't do doing it right, but we take a look at the fact that, well, we created it. We take a look at the planet today, we created the mess. Nature didn't create the mess, we created the mess but we do actually have dominion, which means that not only can we create the mess, we can see that we create the mess, but we can wake up to being good stewards, to husband our planet for its own well-being and the well-being of all who share it. Yeah, I, I love that she shared that because um, it, it, it impacted me as well. Um, the, the thing for me on our vacation that I noticed 
And what I had to wake up to is many of you know that right before I left for vacation that um, the person that I've been the closest to in my entire life um, released his body and that's my father. And so I uh, got to be in a lot of grief. I continue to be. And yet what I, um, I sort of numbed <laughs> my grief upon arriving to our cabin um, with cleaning, folks. I mean, to tell you, I was cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. I bought a dust buster, I got this and that, and any little speck of dirt, I was like, and I, I realized that I was trying to control s something in my life because I felt so out of control right. with things I couldn't control. This, this, this loss of not being able to call my dad and stay connected with him right there. And so I decided then, once I was aware of that, like, first of all, feel the feelings, embrace the feelings, feel the grief, um, be with that grief. And, um, and then what I did was I used the opportunity, uh, we went out in a, in a canoe, to spread his ashes. One of the things he would say is, we're nothing but fish food. And on that particular day, my dad was fish food. We spread his ashes on this pond. Um, I got, to, it was very profound. And, um, and then I saved some, I didn't know why, but I didn't put them all in the pond and I saved some. And then later when Peter wasn't there, I felt uh, compelled to take these, the remaining ashes that I had and place them on the four bushes that we had planted and allow his legacy to grow and to thrive. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was able to um, do something about it instead of just medicating and cleaning our place yeah. to death. Good. Yeah. So in the first example, right, of course, the idea is you can feel completely powerless and helpless. Oh, I don't know what to do about a pond right or uh, medicaid not when karen's example not wanting to feel the feelings just distract ourselves it was pretty funny to watch her i mean we're talking about every single speck of dust and it, or, or dirt and this is a cabin in the woods there was a lot of specks of dust <laughs> and dirt it was quite humorous i left but so the the last thing then is of course to talk about um, then we decided, well, actually I decided months ago that if I'm gonna continue to fly to Europe, I have to pay attention to my carbon footprint. So um, I, um, we drove a car up there that it would, so that it would stay up there at the cabin. And I said, well, I'm not gonna fly home. I'm gonna take the train. I love taking trains in Europe. Why not take the train here? What, what the heck, get sleeper cars. Karen was like, oh, I don't know about that. So, but she said, sure, I'll do it. You're excited, I'll do it with you. And, and so we had two sleeper cars, one from Massachusetts to Chicago, one from Chicago to Dallas. And cozy little, cozy, cozy little, little, the operative word there being little spaces. Um, but um, of course with the pandemic also protected in there, right? Cause so it was, <clears throat> and so we had a lovely, lovely trip home. It was about 48 hours, um, it was beautiful. And let me tell you that the beds are really hard, <laughs> really hard. The beds are really hard. And for some excruciatingly challenging reason or unknown reason, they put the sleeper car right behind the locomotive. Engine. <laughs> the engine, yeah. the locomotive, <laughs> yeah. yes. And they do their train whistle, their engine, every single time they cross a road. <laughs> every time. Of course, not when there's an overpass or an underpass. When they're crossing a road with a crossing guard or with a crossing gates or not, they're beeping that horn. And so the first, the first night coming out of Massachusetts, we were in a very populated area. All night long. Karen was using her earbuds. I did not have earplugs. So not only was the bed hard, it was loud. I am powerless about that, right? There's not a thing I can do about it. I can't make them stop. I can't make them move the car. And what can I do, right? What can we do in that moment? For me, it was a deep act of non-resistance. And it was a deep opportunity for me to remember that I made the decision to do this because I wanna do something for the planet. I don't always want to be run by convenience. 
and quite frankly, I'm not always interested in being run by comfort. I want to be run by my values, and my value is to pay attention to my carbon footprint. So I stopped resisting that the bed was hard. The next night, oh, and you know, we're in the train. It's like, it's, oh, it's rocks. You just sleep. We napped. It was beautiful and quiet and peaceful. And so, yeah, I arrived here. I was not exhausted in any way, shape, or form because there was a willingness to look at what was, this is what is, and in fact, I am powerless to change it. So what I can change is how I'm engaging with it, right? And how I'm approaching it. So, so um, the opportunity here, right? Then we wanna, with these stories, is to take a look at what are the ways in which we can wake up wake up to what's going on and wake up to our resistance, distractions, um, and ways in which we're engaging with it. So the first one, oh, and so it's all about practice, right? In each case, in these stories, right, Karen and I are thrown back into our spiritual practice over and over and over again. And so, um, so, so the question is, what do we need to practice to wake up? What do we need to practice to wake up? The first one in this last example was to acknowledge what's going on, accept it and not resist it, right? Now, I, nobody was being harmed by the fact that the bed was hard, right? That was all, I mean, there was nothing that needed to be changed. It was all fine. It was a decision that I had made. Karen had willingly gone along with it. And so to acknowledge and accept and move into non-resistance, that, that this is all part of the choice that I've made um, and to stop being completely uh, driven by comfort and convenience. Ernest Holmes writes this, everything is as real as it is supposed to be. If a person hurts, he hurts. If she feels badly, she cries. There is want, lack, and apparent limitation in human experience, and there is no use denying it. But perhaps it doesn't need to be. Perhaps it is not intended to be. Right? So we start with acknowledging it. And if, and if there's nothing to do about it, to have acceptance and non-resistance to it. Now, the second way is to change our, the second practice is to change our perspective, to look for the good, to see the good, to feel the feelings and not to distract from them, not to not engage with them, but to hold them differently, to change our perspective about it we can begin to um, look for good news. We can f uh, find out what is happening that is in alignment with what we want to see. There's so many ways in which we can change our perspective. In Karen's example with her dad, right, is to really move into that spiritual reality. He's always going to be here. He's in the pond, he's in the trees, she can talk to him, he looks over her shoulder and looks at all those beautiful wildlife pictures she's taking, right? Or the perspective of, oh my gosh, he's gone forever. And not that there's not grief, but there's a spiritual truth there too. Ernest Holmes says this, science of mind is a liberation theology. The negative use of the creative power of thought then is a very real thing. And indeed is at the root of all of our troubles the negative use of the law. And while we persist in believing that evil is as real as good, we shall experience the evil in which we believe. While we persist in thinking and acting as though limitation were the law of life, we shall continue in bondage. To free ourselves from the contemplation of evil and bondage, projecting as it does the forms of lack, unhappiness, physical disease and such is the whole aim and purpose of the science of mind and spirit. To see life from a different perspective. Yes, absolutely to acknowledge what's going on and to see it from a different perspective. So we affirm the spiritual love and intelligence is moving as humanity through all of the changes that we are seeing and engaged in. We affirm the good, we look for the good. I found a whole new news outlet, I meant to tell you about it, 
um, I found a whole new news outlet of all the amazing climate work that is being done around the world. It is phenomenal, phenomenal, the amount of changes that have happened just in the last three to five years. People are taking this seriously, and humanity is, in fact, the intelligence and love of the universe showing up. We're not powerless. That's what we have to wake up to. And finally, um, in our first example, right, of the pond, is that we have to then begin to engage. We have to act. We have to take responsibility and get involved in the things that matter to us. And of course, responsibility will be our portal into the second stage of consciousness. Ernest Holmes says this, there is an inner urge in our own minds to grow, to expand, to break down the barriers of previous limitations and to ever widen our experience. This persistent urge is a divine influence and irresistible force and constitutes the greatest impulse in human experience. Mostly misinterpreted and misunderstood and often pursuing devious pathways, it is still the urge back of all accomplishment, the promise of all fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, when we saw that pond, humans created the mess, we can clean it up, right? All the, all the convoluted ways the urge for life has been expressed, we can wake up to that. We can make different choices and we can engage differently. I didn't make the mess of that pond, I didn't do anything to cause that pond to be there and I didn't do anything to cause that pond not to be healthy. But I can take responsibility in how I engage, how I perceive it, and how I bring my activity to it. Mm -hmm. So waking up means that we stand on spiritual ground and we're neither unconscious nor are we victims. And, and then we can move forward in faith and trust and use the power of love, boundless love and law as our practice. So despite the conditions, we can know that all is truly well that we are participating in this great awakening of humanity together in our spiritual magnificence and we truly are creating a world that works for all and that we each are creating a life that works for each of us think this is hard well it absolutely can be <laughs> it's not for wimps right but it's worthwhile and it's the only thing that is and it gives us exactly what we need to, en to engage in meaningful uh, ways with life and the people and the world around us. So we have to choose. We have to choose to wake up. We have to choose to see that perhaps we're in sta our f the stage one of consciousness to me. And we have to decide what our choice is from there. Some of you have seen this. I posted it on my Facebook page, uh, my Facebook uh, page a couple days ago. These are words of wisdom from Hopi Indian Chief White Eagle. It was written July 9th of 2021 this year. This moment humanity is experiencing can be seen as a door or a hole. The decision to fall in the hole or walk through the door is up to you. If you consume the news 24 hours a day, with negative energy, constantly nervous, with pessimism, you will fall into this hole. But if you take the opportunity to look at yourself, to rethink life and death, to take care of yourself and others, then you will walk through the portal. Take care of your home. Take care of your body. Connect with your spiritual home. When you take care of yourself, you take care of everyone at the same time. Do not underestimate the spiritual dimension of this crisis. Take the perspective of the eagle that sees everything from above with a broader view. There is a social question in this crisis, but also a spiritual one. The two go hand in hand. Without the social dimension, we fall into fanaticism. Without the spiritual dimension, we fall into pessimism and futility. Are you ready to face this crisis? Grab your toolbox and use all the tools at your disposal. 
learn resistance from the example of Indian and African peoples. We have been and are exterminated, but we never stopped singing, dancing, lighting a fire, and rejoicing. Don't feel guilty for feeling blessed in these troubled times. Being sad or angry doesn't help at all. Resistance is resistance through joy. You have the right to be strong and positive, and there is no other way to do it than to maintain a beautiful, happy, bright posture. This has nothing to do with alienation or ignorance of what's going on in the world. It's a resistance strategy. And when we cross the threshold, we have a new world view because we faced our fears and difficulties. This, this is all you can do now. Serenity in the storm. Keep calm and pray every day. Make a habit of meeting the sacred everywhere. Show resistance through your art, your joy, your trust, and your love. Hopi Indian. Chief White Eagle. That's what it means to wake up in Kingdom One, in stage one of consciousness and decide not to stay there, to decide to move forward, to move beyond it. So I'm gonna invite our band up here. We're gonna close with a beautiful song. Um, you've heard it here before. You've probably heard it in other spiritual traditions in other spiritual places. Um, and um, so this song, it's called It Is Well With My Soul. And one of the things that's so powerful is the story about how this song was written. It was written by a man the named Horatio Spafford. He was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago. And on November 21st, 1873, he sent his wife and four children on an ocean liner back to Europe, saying that he would join them shortly, but he had some business to attend to. He'd be on the next boat a few days later. Four days into the crossing of the Atlantic, the boat collided with an iron-hulled Scottish ship. Within approximately 12 minutes, it slipped beneath the waters. Almost all the passengers were killed and died in the accident, including his four daughters. His wife was found with the very few survivors. As they were rowing the boat around the wreckage, they found her, pulled her out, got her on an, with the other survivors onto another vessel. And she, when she arrived in Wales, she sent a message back, saved alone, what shall I do? says Mr. Spafford framed this telegram and placed it in his office to remember the moment. A few days later, he was on that ship going to Europe to meet his grieving wife. Four days out, the captain called him into his stateroom and said, here, this is where that accident would have happened. And it is during the time his, his daughter later uh, conceived, his daughter writes, it was during this time of this passage that he wrote this song. Finding that spiritual ground, the higher ground from which to move through the challenges of life. Remembering it is always well with our soul.
fé 